I'm Kirsty Van Gogh and I'm a project manager at Neil Bochan Associates and I'm here with Andrew Moore and um, Andrew's going to be talking about his project with the British Council and how he used um, different communications channels to and the latest technology to maximize project reach. Andrew was the instructional designer on this project. He also worked as the production manager and the social media strategist. It's uh, nice to chat about this, Andrew. I don't think we get enough um, opportunity to talk about our projects. So it's good to see what you've done and see where, you know, where we can improve. What we really want to be talking about is to see how the latest technologies, um, social media platforms and multimedia rich messaging can work in developing world context when we thought we may just be limited to traditional communications uh, channels in possibly resource poor contexts or uh, just in like more traditional um, or conservative contexts. Uh, yes, uh, it was called the A21 Guidelines. Uh, it was a British Council iWork project, uh, and they were working in close collaboration with uh, the Department of Higher Education and Training, and specifically the Indlela campus, which is basically their apprenticeship school wing. Uh, South Africa is embarking on a, a new approach to apprenticeships. The previous model had proved inefficient and um, extremely difficult to administer and therefore they wanted to introduce um, a model very similar to what's being used in some countries in Europe. Uh, it was, it's be called the A21 and uh, basically it calls for close collaboration between these eight different stakeholders. The reason why this particular project seems interesting was because unlike other projects there were actually eight different stakeholders and therefore in terms of communication we had to come up with a communication strategy that would talk to eight different target audiences which proved to be quite difficult and you can see they they ranged in ages um, different cultural backgrounds education levels that, that you'll see uh, was the issue that we had to confront. So what were they trying to do? Specifically, they wanted the A21 guidelines to be a digital uh, introduction to this new approach to training apprentices. And the idea was it was to be aimed at the eight stakeholder groups and provide them with um, a quick overview of what their particular role is in this relationship of the A21. Um, when was this project conceptualized and developed? Um, so the project was very much a post, oh, sorry, a pre-COVID um, pandemic uh, initiative and therefore we were grappling with many of the old ideas which had permeated deep into South African culture in terms of what is appropriate for um, communication strategies and and so on. Prior to to the COVID pandemic, uh, the the thinking was that for a message to be um, effectively disseminated, it needed to be very simple and very low tech. Um, and but what was interesting was the British Council and DHET were very keen to try and confront this approach to communication strategies. Uh, the idea is they wanted it to be uh, an interactive guideline. They wanted it to have animations. They wanted it to be very visual. They wanted the text to be reduced to as little as possible. Um, they wanted to include podcasts and well, little audio clips of what people were doing. And then in the line with the the development of the guidelines, they felt that they didn't want to do traditional top down from the ministry down approach. They wanted to use social media as a way to push the message out there. Um, and uh, so that was the brief. They asked us to come up with um, an interpretation of the guidelines. The guidelines arrived. They were very much um, a text based document, very wordy uh, and um, the idea was we had to then reinterpret it into this new approach. And um, yeah, so that was the challenge. 
Okay. Um, I think it's interesting because you're working with uh, stakeholders who are sort of like the employers and people that are in apprenticeships, which is traditionally a very um, hands-on kind of uh, profession rather than like relying on texts or, you know, it's not like you are working with teachers which who are used to working with a lot of texts. So I think it's a nice approach that they're taking. Um, so I'm interested to know how that went. Yes, uh, you're right. You would think that apprenticeships uh, would be kind of a very conservative environment um, yeah. and therefore very traditional in the way that they would approach communication. But um, no, um, <laughs> I don't know if it was the young students, uh, the young apprentices who kind of made these people feel that they had to now uh, raise the, the, the level of the game. Um, mm. I don't, I'm not sure because when you look at the group, uh, and when we engaged with some of the lecturers and the um, uh, government officials, a lot of them were very traditional and um, mm. very entrenched in an old way of thinking. But it was very clear that DHET and the British Council had this vision that they wanted to try a different approach. Who do you think the message reached optimally? Like who received the message as you were trying to put it out in your digital progressive way? format? Yes, yeah, so when we looked at the data, it was quite encouraging about um, how people were engaging with it. It looks like those people who were either urban, uh, youth, from the youth, um, and, and or affluent and therefore familiar with and had good access to digital uh, communication tools, they seem to have embraced the, the approach quite um, openly. Um, the, the reason why we're not saying it was a total success was the, the figures we got um, were good, but they weren't like mind blowing. All right. So they were, um, again, we're a little bit struggling with who didn't get the message. And um, it's, we would have to surmise then that part of the old adage that we need to use simple uh, technologies in order to engage with those people who are in resource poor areas. Um, it looks like they didn't get the particular information. We had numerous requests for the paper version or for the digital version. And um, so the idea then was, uh, it looked like a lot of people saying, yeah, yeah, all, this is all very nice and very sexy and so on, but hey, where's the paper version that I can share with my mates who are further down the line and less likely to engage with the the digital materials. So uh, we, uh, initially we put our foot down and said, no, you need to engage with the digital stuff. But in the end we had to capitulate. And so therefore we did make a static, quite texty, we had pictures in it, but quite texty version, which then also was distributed uh, informally. So therefore we have no data on quite how far that document reached. Andrew, can you talk a little bit about how the content was conceptualized, how um, all the pieces of media were put together and what your strategy for this was. The way we have spoken previously, it sounds like we just randomly tried a bit of everything and just threw it out there. But no, we actually did have some architecture. We, we uh, tried to work out how, how to structure the messages. So uh, the idea then was we wanted everyone to arrive at the website. That was one of our objectives. And the other one was to spread awareness. So the various components had to work to those two ends. The, the way we started the, each drive was using a email client, um, one of these bulk email clients. Uh, we used MailChimp in this case, where we had a database of around about 3000 email addresses that had been accumulated during various uh, in Glaedler uh, workshops and British Council workshops. So we had a nice starting point with these people who we knew were potentially of interest to what we were doing, would have some interest. And the idea then was in the email, we would drive the characters, uh, the, the readers through a, 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 a period of awareness and then hopefully onto the actual website. Um, the MailChimp also helped us send messages to Facebook. So admittedly, the, the group was different. Um, Facebook uses its 
has its own network. And so therefore we also discovered that um, the people we were reaching with Facebook were well, uh, we had never conceptualized who these people might be. And it was amazing uh, who actually did engage with those materials. Uh, in parallel, MailChimp also sent a message through our Twitter channels. We used the British Council and DHET's social media uh, platforms, but we also developed our own ones specifically for the A21 guidelines. And then we experimented also with LinkedIn. Uh, we now realize that we didn't really strategize properly for LinkedIn. We didn't fully appreciate um, what would be a good communication strategy specifically for that platform. So it didn't really return the numbers that we wanted. Um, we would do it very differently today. However, all three of those social media platforms were designed to build awareness, but then push people towards the, the website. And then in, um, in opposition, well, not opposition, in, in support, we also had a number of um, media that we were pushing to. Uh, in the diagram, we got pictures of MailChimp pushing them, but they didn't. Actually, we, we hard coded those. So we used YouTube and SoundCloud, SoundCloud for the podcasts to try and build an awareness, and then uh, YouTube for the animations to try and get people to engage. And again, the idea was that we would push people from those platforms to the website. Um, in terms of the messaging, do you think you got your message across effectively or what would you change next time? Um, yes, it was very much a learning pathway for us. Um, we were coming from a very traditional approach in terms of communication strategies. And now in retrospect, when we've got some feedback from the various stakeholders, what we've discovered is we hadn't fully let go. We were still clinging to many of the old ideas and strategies that had worked previously. Uh, for example, the guidelines, when you look at them, they are still extremely text heavy. We thought we slashed them. We thought we had cut them really right down, but there's still a lot of reading in there. And um, for many people who, uh, especially the new generation, but also um, people who are busy, um, large amounts of text is a turn off now. Uh, people wanted really, really small bite size. Um, so I think we were still too text heavy. And then even our animations were, we got feedback that we still had too much text, even in the animations. We did have a voiceover artist to actually make it more accessible, but we were told we were a bit skimp on the voice. We should have had a lot more of the voice, maybe less text and more voice. Uh, but again, I think that was a throwback to uh, what we had be, uh, been used to. If we were to now take all that information and, and put it together, so what, what are we hearing? If we to look at the old continuum, which said, on the one hand, we have very sim simple strategies in order to have effective communication versus up the other end of the continuum, a more digital, modern, and perhaps progressive approach to the, the uh, teaching, uh, to the message. Um, the, what we discovered then was that um, despite the, the the wisdom of previous or pre-COVID was that, um, no, you don't have to be up the one end. You can position yourself quite effectively somewhere on that continuum between analog, traditional, conservative versus digital, modern, progressive um, approach. Uh, so um, we obviously work in developing world context. So I'm thinking now we've got to a point especially in South Africa, where the, the, the messages don't need to always be dumbed down, that there is now a large enough group um, who is amenable to this type of communication strategy. The idea is that you've got to find that, that sweet spot on that continuum or have a couple of nodes on the continuum where you um, de devise specific communication messages to to appeal to the different groups. That was part of our problem with this very diverse stakeholder group, was to craft a message which was fun and attractive for a student is very different from when you're talking to say an quality assurance official. Um, they just live in completely different worlds. And therefore the fact that we were trying to craft a single message which would apply and appeal 
to these two different groups was perhaps a hiding to nowhere. And um, for anybody that wants to explore the A21 guidelines and see some of the messages, listen to your podcasts, the links will all be um, in the blog post on the NBA website.